So I'll actually get started. Um, so I'm just going to talk for a bit and then I'm going to show you a little project. I want to show you a project that's, <coughs> bear me one second, um, super accessible um, in terms, terms of the edge deployment. There were lots of different projects I could show you that are really complicated and are destined to be embedded systems. But we're going to show you something very modular, um, just so I... I'm hoping that some of you are kind of on edge of getting started with this kind of stuff. And you're like, oh, this stuff is actually really accessible. Um, so the first thing I'm going to say, um, or the first thing I'm going to ask of you guys is, what is the edge to you? Why is it so important? Why is everybody talking about it right now? Um, it's a bit of a buzzword, isn't it? But it'd be really nice to break it down before I start showing you some stuff. What is the edge? Has anyone got... Can anyone speak up? Or you can actually throw it up in the chat as well if you want. It'd be, you yeah, know. <laughs> is someone talking it? No, that's okay. It's a bit, um, it's a, it, it is being thrown around, isn't it? So uh, to me, the edge is, uh, well, first of all, let's break it down in terms of, there was a little bit of a, a, a cloud revolution, wasn't there? Um, we were kind of pushing everything to the cloud, VM instances and, you know, uh, multiple GPU deployment and all this exciting stuff that was happening. Um, but if you really break down some of the, the possible problems that's happened to all of us who have been involved in all kinds of cloud engineering projects or who have just been messing around with it, some of the things that can come up are latency issues, right? So if you're outsourcing to say, for instance, Google Vision API is incredible, right? But you have um, some downtime on your end and then you've got a bit of a problematic project or a problematic deployment there. Um, it's a oh, nice face there, you know. Um, good to have you, um, welcome. And um, so yeah, you've got a problem with latency there, right? And you've got a um, problem with, some people are concerned about privacy being a bit of a thing, right? And if you think about uh, networking in general, um, if we're pushing to the cloud or if we're relying on those APIs, there's a lot of power consumption there as well. So there's a few things that we want to solve when it comes to um, thinking about the paradigm uh, of deployment in general. One of the solutions and one of the buzzwords and one of the things that's come along um, into the world now is edge computing. And I'm really trying to get you guys to tell me what you think the edge is. Can anyone tell me what they think an edge device would be? Because everyone's saying edge device, edge device. What is an edge device? Oh, you are Smart talking phone. in the chat. Hello, the place where stuff happens. Cloud connected device. Yeah, um, I like to use the term, uh, and Sirium is saying the edge refers to endpoints of cloud that is now preferred due to latency, privacy, personalization issues of cloud. Perfect. Yeah, that's a, that's a great little synopsis. It's always great to ask you guys because you guys really know what you're talking about. And some people have better ways of saying things than me, right? Um, so yeah, for sure, all of those things. Latency is a problem. Privacy is a problem. And so we want to bring computing as close as we can to the edge. By edge devices, we mean mobile phones, uh, edge devices. And yes, a lot of things are um, connected to the internet, but not always. This is why I always like to use the term um, hybrid edge in that sense. On a mobile phone, we'd be deploying with, say, for instance, TensorFlow Lite for all of you um, who aren't familiar with the TensorFlow ecosystem. There are plenty of ways of optimizing and compressing models now to have them running on your phone. And you can do that and you can verify it with your phone as you're knocking around the world thinking about um, verifying your models. Um, another thing we could argue is the edge or is um, like, say, for instance, autonomous vehicles. We could argue the same thing, right? They, we don't want to have a self-driving car that suddenly has that kind of networking issue. And then all of a sudden there are problems. We've already spoken about a lot of these kind of ethical issues with self-driving cars. Um, and a lot of you have probably seen examples and videos of not only um, image segmentation where you're segmenting that road, and we'll talk about it again when we're looking at um, deployment in practice, but not only is there image segmentation, but you'll see a lot of videos of object detection, so actually following other cars there, right? You don't want to be relying on a cloud API. Maybe they've got great servers. I actually don't know. Um, I'm not one of the engineers there, but um, 
what, one of the things that we're concerned about with, um, with the edge in that sense. And another thing that could be considered um, uh, the edge are uh, one of these, a single board computer. Has anyone seen one of these before? Can anyone speak up in the chat or whack on their um, microphone and let me know what they think this is? This is pretty famous now. This is an old one. Yeah, it's a Raspberry Pi, right? Uh, Pi, yeah. I like all the question marks. You don't have to worry about the question mark. You know what you're talking about. Um, it's uh, a Raspberry Pi. This is a really old iteration. Um, well, not necessarily that old, but the Raspberry Pi 3B+. Plus. Um, and it was pretty powerful. It was um, it's quad core. It has a system on chip. Bear me one second. I'm just going to move my leg. Um, it has a system on chip. So we've got our processor in there. We've got our GPU in there, the Broadcom GPU. And now we've moved on to the Raspberry Pi 4. They're pretty powerful now, um, way more powerful. But still, regardless, um, regardless of that case, they're still not quite capable of deploying deep learning models, right? Maybe TensorFlow Lite, but we need that kind of extra boost, right? Now, the extra boost comes with one of these guys. Do you guys know what this is or what this is? This is its big brother. You guys might have seen these out in the wild. Nothing on the chat. So what this is kind of looks like a, something you would apply to your, but it's a USB stick. It's a, a VPU. Now, you guys might have heard of tensor processing units. They're available in Google Colab. They're available in a lot of um, uh, cloud platforms. Um, you've heard of VPUs. You might have heard of GPUs, which have become really important for deep learning, right? Deep, um, GPUs are these incredible um, workhorses that exist uh, now that started off as those kind of gaming workhorses and have become more and more specialist. Yes, the Intel Meridius chip, that's exactly what it is. Um, they've become more and more and more specialists now where we have specialist tensor cores, um, mixed precision cores that are kind of speeding up training with deep learning and so on. Um, I can't do all that on this. Or at least I can't get very good inference time on this. Um, I need one of these to outsource to, right? Now, my understanding of the situation or the kind of narrative behind it all, and excuse slack there, um, is they were they originally set out to have um, uh, processes that could handle real world physics. Um, that's not, uh, and apparently people don't want that in their, mo in their mobile phones, right? They just want uh, to play Candy Crush. So we actually got kind of outsourced to another, they pushed it to, to these, this situation and the Open Vino Toolkit. Now, the Open Vino Toolkit is really important um, in terms of kind of deployment for you guys, because not only does it help optimize your TensorFlow, PyTorch, uh, MXNet, whatever um, API you want to use, um, it's not only does it help you do that, but you are also capable of downloading. Um, pre-trained models from their modern model zoo, from the TensorFlow model zoo, from all these different uh, ecosystems and bring it into OpenVINO Toolkit, optimize, uh, smash all your variables in there um, and, and, and cuss again and then have it outsourced to this. Now, the reason I'm talking about this um, in particular is because of the kind of um, platform agnosticism, right? Um, a lot of us are working on different operating systems. A lot of us are working um, in different scenarios, but we want a, our model to work no matter what, what we're doing, whether we're working with Windows or whether we're working with Ubuntu 16, which tends to always be the, the platform that's stable, right? Um, or we can put it on a Raspberry Pi, we can put it in our laptops, um, which is why I'm talking about this because I don't know what you guys have on your end. Um, but it's worth bearing in mind that it's got, been pushed further than that now. Right now, we're witnessing this kind of explosion. You're seeing um, NVIDIA starting to, to push out those development boards now. Um, NVIDIA Drive now. You can find NVIDIA Drive in these huge racing autonomous robots. Professional leagues are starting to form. 
and we're starting to see it really mature now. Um, you know, on the side that you can get something very close to that now with the NVIDIA Jetson line as well, right? The, those kind of um, uh, single board computers that are destined and ready to be in an embedded system for you to deploy artificial intelligence on the edge without having to do that extra networking work. Um, so get yourself one of these, get yourself one of these and stop messing around. And then you've got that kind of um, gateway to the next phase, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start sharing my screen and I'm going to show you a little demo of what you can do with this kind of thing. And then we're going to actually try it and get as close as we can in collab to that kind of situation. So if you bear me one second, I am just going to switch on my Raspberry Pi on this end. Um, so I'm just going to plug it in. Another chance for you guys to all have a good chat. Another example while this is loading up and you should hear her talking a little bit. Um, so um, another example of um, a project that I think is starting to migrate to that kind of idea is, I don't know whether anyone's seen the situation with the snow leopards with, um, with Azure and with um, uh, Microsoft. Uh, snow leopards are having a bit of a struggle right now, right? Um, so we want to look for more examples of kind of industry-based uh, examples. Snow leopards are struggling. Um, object detection uh, models are really helping track individual snow leopards right now with, oh, there you go, she's having a talk. Um, uh, and that deployment is, is getting close and closer to the edge for that project, I believe. So do look that up and I will link you to it afterwards. So you hear Miss Mini B talk there, right? Um, so I'm going to switch over my camera in a second. What's happening is she has a local server built into a, um, a Mary TTS, a local server. Now, the reason I'm talking about Mary TTS as in a, um, a text to speech server is we'll be seeing the inverse of that later on. You'll be deploying, you'll be recording your speech and you'll be doing the old uh, speech to text with some bi-directional uh, recurrent neural networks. Um, and I'm gonna show you how easy it is to deploy on one of these now. Back in the days, on the first iteration in Mavidius, it was all about vision and all about vision models in uh, the uh, OpenVINO um, Zoo. But now it's starting to really mature and we've got these kind of um, RNNs available to us, text recognition, um, key point recognition as well. So our limbs and our joints. So a lot of people are using um, motion detection right now to, um, to map to robots or to map to other characters. So there's all kinds of cool stuff that's starting to sort of migrate into the entertainment industry. So it's exciting to see that boom kind of expand out into this kind of interdisciplinary thing, right? Um, so she's on and she's ready to go. Um, let me just switch my uh, screen. So I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to switch my camera all at the same time. If you can all throw up some ones as well, if you can see my screen, um, you might actually have a little bit of, um, it might be obscured a bit in the bottom left because of the chat box, but I want to see what you guys are saying. Um, so I'm going to throw up a one. You can see my screen. And now I'm going to switch my camera, if you bear me one second. <clears throat> Let me know if I've muted myself. I keep doing that all the time. Um, ones. We can see the ones. Okay, so we switched over to Mini B, right? She's a bit of a mess right now while I'm developing her. Um, uh, I really want to get kids into this kind of idea, right? Um, so all we've got here is um, a, a 3D part here that I uh, developed in um, Tinkercad. For those of you who are looking to get a really quick in um, to that kind of um, 3D development, but don't really know much about um, the more complex uh, uh, software that's available out there, it's really easy to put something together in Tinkercad. Um, so this whole kind of bottom part of the chassis is that. And then all I've done is I've plunked a Raspberry Pi on top and then I've put this motorboard on top. Um, but she can also do other things like I can uh, switch her keyboard on. Um, so the idea for me, uh, if I can find my, if you bear me one second, I just need to find my keyboard. 
Aha. So the idea for me is I wanted to have that kind of user robot uh, kind of loop going on. My um, so she's um, if I take pictures as well, she'll let me know that I'm taking pictures. The idea for me was um, I'm always deploying uh, uh, deep learning models that I've made myself or trained myself. Right, I'm always mucking around with the architecture or. Um, and I, I want to verify it very quickly, right? So what OpenVINO has allowed me to do uh, in conjunction with just a tiny little robot or the big robot I got over here is I can tweak it, right? I can take a bunch of pictures. I can, um, I can then label those and then I can press a button on my, my keyboard and then I can have that sent either to a local server um, or, to G or to Google Cloud I can then have her wait with a sub process for the model to be finished. And then it gets sent back to her. She tells me if it's successful. Um, and then I can verify it on the spot with the keyboard, um, with, in, with her own inference. And we're gonna see that right now. Um, does anyone have any issues? We'll debug that in a second, um, Jen. That's probably something to do with the permissions I've given you. but. Um, are you your same remote, Michelle? Yeah, these are these are really handy. Um, you can you can plug anything into like Pygame or whatever kind of um, a library you want to use there. Um, but yeah, there's, there's I wanted a lot of keys, so I wanted to be able to to train and to send and to um, uh, to execute inference and so on and so forth. But let's uh, look away from Mini B right now um, and let's look at my screen and I'm just gonna hook you guys up with so the great thing about Raspberry Pi and you'll find this with the NVIDIA development boards also is that it's an entire operating system Oh, sorry. That's my password. I don't mind you guys having my password. <laughs> How embarrassing. I'll change it tonight. Um, does anyone know what, has anyone seen this movie? I love this movie. I love this guy. Uh, feel free to speak up on the microphone if you know who this guy you, is. You get extra points. Interstellar, yes. Uh, Sri Ram, you, you're, you're the winner. Um, Interstellar is a great movie. Um, Cool. So we're in, we're basically um, remotely hooked up to um, the Raspberry Pi now. Like I said, you could do this on NVIDIA development boards. You can do this on Odroid. You can do this on all these kind of single board computers and these um, these other kind of hybrid platforms. This is Raspbian. Um, there are uh, there are Linux for Tegra and other kind of derivations that exist for um, different platforms. But it works a lot like Linux, um, you know, it's based on top of it. it's Debian, which is like a, again, a um, built on top. So the first thing I'm going to do is, like I said, she um, is meant to be the entire package. So every time I whack her on, she has a script running in the background and I'm using a terminal multiplexer, a Tmux to make sure that if something goes wrong, I can hook up to that session anytime. I like and see what it is that's going wrong. So I'm gonna shut all that down um, just so I can show you guys the um, inference. I'm just gonna look at that. Uh, and it's probably the top process, right? Cause it's doing all the stuff. And then the next thing I need to do is I need to go to Pi Blaster. Um, so for those of you who can see here, you can see I've got a bunch of jumper wires that are hooked up to all these GPIO pins here. Um, one of the things that happened uh, with Mini B, one of the things I, I learned the hard way for those of you guys who are going to go down this road is GPIO 18, the 18th pin, uh, does a lot with the sound. Um, and, it, it, and if you plug in a servo, 
to GPIO 16 and you also have sound plugged in, you're going to get a crazy, crazy, crazy squeal. I found out the hard way. My cat found out the hard way, but I need to run this, um, this command to just circumvent it, right? So let me just get into my project and I'm going to show you a little bit of code and we're going to talk a little bit about multiprocessing um, and so on and so forth. I'm going to get it ready. Uh, I never remember my commands, so we're up ready. Cool. Um, download works now. Total folder size is, yeah, Jan, it is pretty big. There's, um, I'll tell you why, actually, um, later on in the situation, but you actually don't have to have those pre-made files um, available to yourself there, but we'll have a look at that in a second. So another thing I'm going to do, and another thing you can do that's really great, um, with uh, Raspberry Pis um, or these kind of systems is we can also mount our um, file system and we can work on that remotely in that sense. I hope no one's trying to hack me now with my... Uh... I guess I've just invited you guys to do that, right? No, <laughs> thanks, Michelle. That's very kind of you. Um, so let's do this and let's open up. And I'll talk to you a little bit about my project structure. Is it, does anyone know this ID? Does anyone use it? Does anyone get the Python joke that it's referring to? We all know that Python was, it's, it's a Monty Python reference, right? So if you, it's Eric IDE. I'll have a chuckle to myself. Um, so basically what we're seeing here in terms of the, um, the core of where I'm going to push you guys towards, right? Is we're going to, um, we're going to, we're going to head into Google Colab and we're going to use, um, uh, the infer the open Vino inference engine. We're going to use the old version of the inference engine. And I say the old version, it's actually only like the 2019 revision. Um, but there's a lot, there's a lot of kind of stability there. I will talk about the 2021, 2020 revision because it's uh, supporting a lot of really exciting models like efficient net. Um, and we'll talk about efficient net later on. Um, but it's worth bearing in mind when you guys are experimenting with this stuff that this is the 2019 revision and this is the um, 2019 revision of the inference engine in general, which means we're having to give device plugins ourselves, like CPU device plugins, but we'll have a look at that later. So what I've got here, we don't need to look at the motors because they just manually tune really boring algorithms um, uh, for um, the head and the motors. We're going to look at the interesting part, which is the actual inference engine itself and what I'm actually doing with that inference. So what I'm actually doing with the inference and what you guys are going to get really close to by the end of this entire session is um, we're grabbing our inference with OpenCV. Does anyone know, has anyone come across OpenCV? Or can anyone tell me what OpenCV is? Open Computer Vision. I mean, I can't, I've given it away, yeah. Computer vision library, that's exactly it. Um, open computer vision is incredibly robust. It, you, you can do all your image pre-processing with it. You can um, use your old school al algorithms. You can use um, har cascade to find faces. You know, you can um, dilate images to get rid of things dynamically and um, automated, but it also plays really nice with a lot of these libraries has its own um, neural network plugin. Um, it plays really nice with um, things like this. It plays really nice with up and coming platforms like OpenVINO. Um, and the thing that you really know need to know about this and the thing that we'll look at later is this method here, this little bit of uh, functionality is CV2 video capture is a really, really flexible um, thing to use because not only does it take images, but it also takes video streams, um, whether those are um, pre-recorded or whether those are cameras. It's a super flexible thing to use. So I suggest that you guys get involved with CVD video capture tomorrow, but we'll do it like 
today as well. So all we're doing is we're um, loading our stream. Um, we're grabbing our inference with the, uh, not with the CPU, but with the, uh, the VPU, right? Um, and then we're just multiplying the creative Python came up with the name for the language. Yeah, exactly. There you go. You did a bit of research. I like that. <laughs> you went down a little bit of a rabbit hole. So all we're doing is we're taking the inference and we're just multiplying that inference by the original frame size, um, which is 640 by 480, I believe, just to get ourselves coordinates. And then all that's happening, and again, we'll look at this later, is we're taking those coordinates and we're drawing bounding boxes with open computer vision. And we'll actually see this in practice in a second um, um, based on our object detections. And I will talk about object detection um, models in a second. And then all I'm doing is I'm whacking the standard um, bounding boxes, but I've also done a few basic calculations like getting the midpoint of both um, axes um, and getting a just general sense of width without going into like um, kind of um, 3D baseline algorithms and stuff. We're just doing like really basic um, ideas of width. And then we're putting that into a multi-processing queue. Now, can anyone tell me why I'm using multi-processing here and I'm not using multi-threading? Because there's a... Um, would I share a link to the camera I'm using? Yeah, for sure, I will. Right at the end, I will get, I'll give you all the information you need and I'll get that sent your way, no problem whatsoever. Um, can anyone tell me why I'm engaging with multiprocessing here? And to give you a little bit of context, because I really want to push you guys in this direction, um, what all of this is doing is I'm performing my inference for object detection, which we'll see in a little bit. And then I want to influence this head and I want to influence these wheels. I essentially want it to follow items. Now I've got a little bit of tweaking to do um, in the sense that her, her wheels aren't as powerful as I want her to be, not as powerful as this big robot over here. Um, thread safety. Yeah, there you go. And yeah, the, the GIL, the global interpreter lock. Yeah, that's exactly why. So um, it's easy for us to fall down that pitfall, right? Where um, where we, we've got two threads and we're like, okay, we're good. We can, we can have things running in parallel, but it's, it's the illusion of, uh, of, of parallel, right? Because of the global interpreter lock. We, what we really need to do is we need to be pushing to a queue and we need to be sending to um, the, the wheels and we need to be sending to the head um, that inference. Otherwise they're gonna slow each other down um, they get, in terms of actually enacting these which is why um, the multi-processing road is happening here. Um, and then we're simply just um, displaying uh, what we're seeing, which we're going to have a look now. Um, so let's go ahead and do what we got to do. And yeah, so I'm glad you guys got the old, uh, the answers there for the thread safety situation. Um, so let's actually just switch off her motors in a um, body right now. And I'm going to show you the head first because I ran into a little bit of a problem. Something I realized. Bear me one second. I'm actually just going to switch this off. I didn't realize I didn't switch it off. I've got to save. Because I just want to show you the detection right now. So what I've got inside her right now is um, is one of these, the neural compute stick, right? So you can see that we're seeing um, uh, that the async mode is on. So what it means is frame, we can uh, we can be output in a frame, but we can also be uh, queuing up the next um, inference. And then we've also got um, rendering time. So we just basically start a timer um, and then we can see how long it takes to, to render. Um, but if I whack this here, you can see a couple of false positives there. But what we're seeing here is SSD mobile net. Um, and you can see I've only got four. Um, I haven't actually uh, put a kind of custom label there. But I've suppressed all the other um, outputs. And I'm only drawing my bounding box for uh, an orange. 
I tend to use an orange a lot, and you can see this is getting a little bit moldy now. I tend to use an orange a lot because it's an easy, like, circular shape, right? And it's very bright, and it's easy to um, verify models with. Um, I've actually gotten involved in quite a bit of this was a fine tune model with the uh, TensorFlow Object Detection API. And we'll actually look at that, but we won't actually engage in that this time around. Um, but you can see it's pretty uh, on the ball, right? So I can probably have this influence my motors. Um, does anyone know about object detection models? Does anyone know how they, they work in general, especially the single shot detectors? That family have become really important in this kind of field. Anyone want to speak up about that, perhaps? So with object detection models, and especially with this kind of new, um, we had faster RCNN, right? Um, we went from classification to object, de to object detection. And what we mean by object detection is usually you would have um, in this, um, we'd just be uh, performing classification on our image, right? Um, we'd say, you know, is this, a, is this a tree or whatever? And we'd get our top 10 outputs or with object detection, with localization, what we're doing is we're performing our classification for multiple objects within a frame, which is super powerful. And you guys have seen that again with um, self-driving cars, right? Um, so, the I mean, there's still traditional image classification involved. We still got um, a lot of the time it's VGG16 with those uh, with those stacked convolutions or it's mobile net, which is this one, which is a really efficient, deployable and mobile platforms um, uh, architecture. Um, a lot of the time, the, the classifier is just a standard one and we're grabbing our features that way um, with, with our classifier. Um, and then does anyone know what the next phase is there? So we, we, we grabbed our features, right? Um, and then we've got a bunch of predefined anchors. They're nothing to do with the detection necessarily. So um, a set of ratios and a set of sizes, because what we want is we want to find things in the distance or we want to find things that are like in the corner, right? Or we want to find things in different zooms or different um, uh, blurs or these different scenarios, translation and variance, right? So we've got all of these predefined anchors and then we've then we have a, a region of interest network on top of that that starts grabbing things that it thinks are objects and not the background um, and then we have a bunch of uh, just generic detections right and then non maximum yeah rpm there you go um, and then non maximum suppression happens so what we do is we get rid of everything that has an IOU under a certain level. So by IOU intersection over union, we mean all those anchor boxes that we had predefined. If once we've got those regions of interest, the overlap is less than 0.5, I believe it might be 0.45, we get rid of them. And if they're below um, a certain confidence level, we also get rid of those. And then in one single shot, we get those detections. And we don't, and what we'll see later is we don't just get detections with one object. We're talking about multiple objects in one single shot. Really easily deployable, really efficient. Okay, so let's switch on her head and let's see if that happens. And then we'll move you guys on to doing stuff. Um, so So I'm just going to switch on her uh, the head process, just like so. And then we're going to try and do the head and the body, and I'll talk about a little bit why I think there's a bit of a problem. So she should snap in place in a second. Hopefully, you'll be able to see her head moving. I don't know why I'm not getting my output, so if you bear me one second. Right, and we should have a head following. Now you can see that um, 
I need a bit, do a little bit of tuning and a bit of tweaking. But she's doing all right. The general idea is to have her um, center it. Um, obviously, she's not moving left to right right now, so she's just centering on that axis. This is really easy for you guys to do. And the tuning, like I said, is done manually. So I, I'm, I'm just saying um, if the, the midpoint of the bounding box is a past a certain, uh, is up to the top of the frame or to the bottom of the frame, she just readjusts her head. Um, and we, we could obviously use other neural networks to tune or we could use con uh, control loops or some kind of logic to kind of dampen the movement. I haven't got that far yet. So let's try the, and you'll see that she just starts scanning if there's nothing around. So if the multi-processing queue is empty, she'll just start having a scan until she finds, until, so once um, the, the inference isn't empty anymore, once there's something in the queue, she'll snap out of it. So you should see that in a second. You see on the run up, she has a big kind of twitch. So I need to also dampen that as well then. And then I'll do it again. So let's try the body. It's not working so well right now. Now, the reason I think that's happening um, uh, is I believe we're using the same cue, right? So the inference is all, so I think they're all just grabbing um, from it. So it, we're, basically getting less inference on one, on one side. So I either need to block it or I need multiple cues. Who knows? Anyone have any ideas? So hopefully we should get her following now. There you go. Now I need to tune and you should see her moving back as well. I need to tune her a bit because she used to jump back really in a really animated way. Um, and her motors aren't strong enough to move left to right really fast without like really precise tuning. But you can see how good the, the multi-processing is uh, dealing with that situation in terms of You can see my moldy orange, I do apologize. I should have got a better, more professional prop there. Um, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna actually move on pretty quickly because um, I think you guys have got a pretty good sense of it. But you can see that she's jittering away um, for reasons that are probably to do with the engineering of my uh, my Q situation there. And you saw like there's a couple of false positives there with my fingers as well, right? Um, so I'll leave it there and let's move on. I wanna try and get you guys as close to I, as I can to this kind of situation. So you're kind of deploying in your own scenarios at home or in your own little scientific projects. There are actually a lot of these, um, up, well, there's one of these up in the International Space Station right now doing experiments, right? So um, let me just get rid of this. And then let's debug the situation with the notebook. Um, how's everyone doing at this point? Let me get rid of this. I'm gonna switch my camera. So I'm gonna keep this camera on because we're gonna use our cameras to do some silly things. And it, it caused some problems last time using my, uh, um, my laptop camera. So let me just get rid of this um, and let's get you guys uh, up and running with your notebooks. So you guys now should have access to edge deployment. I'm gonna get rid of this little chat box. Uh, thank you. Um, so we're gonna use this one first, inference TF2. Now, I always say this to you guys, um, uh, what, you, um, what it's worth doing, I think, in this scenario, and we will be using um, kind of references to the actual whole package of the folder. If you go into shared with me and click on what I've shared with you and um, send a shortcut to your drive, all of this will work a lot smoother um, and you'll be able to have access then to um, within your own kind of 
um, Google Drive file system. So make sure, like I said, to go to Shade with me and to hook up yourself up with a link on your side. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at two scenarios here. The first scenario is um, literally just grabbing a model and checking the inference um, just uh, with the TensorFlow Object Detection API. Um, and I'm really excited about TensorFlow 2. Um, you guys should all be excited about TensorFlow 2 as well. So I'm going to show you a really easy method with the um, visualization tools that don't involve you having to know anything about OpenCV. But then we will look at OpenCV in the second notebook. Um, the reason why we're looking at TensorFlow 2 is, um, does it, what does everyone know about TensorFlow 2? Um, some of you might have been at the last session, but it's worth reiterating, I think. What's different? Let me get this up as well. Okay, so TensorFlow 2, uh, Keras, yeah, for sure. That That is one of the big things, right? It's, it used to be Keras was kind of separate and then you'd have TensorFlow. Um, Keras is now the official uh, high level API. Um, so things are really easy to do. Um, it's easy to grab uh, pre-trained models. It's easy to uh, fine tune. It's also easy to autograph on the fly. And we were talking about this last session. Um, there's a dynamic uh, control flow now. So back with TensorFlow 1, um, you have to have all this boilerplate code, right? Um, you have to you know, run sessions and you have to predefine your computational graphs. They started kind of bringing in things later on in the game, but now it's Pythonic um, at the cost of a little bit of um, lost uh, uh, um, inference time, but um, we can add decorators like TF train to, um, to define computational graphs on the fly. So TensorFlow 2 has become really important in that sense um, in terms of just speed um, and in terms of you guys getting involved really quickly and sort of picking up this kind of stuff really quick. Um, also, it's worth bearing in mind that it's migrated to save models now. So instead of, and we're going to be looking at some frozen inference graphs from um, back in the old school TensorFlow 1 era where everything's kind of fused in one um, with uh, save models now the assets are separate and they've kind of depreciated that kind of old idea um so i'm still figuring out in terms of deployment with open vino and so on because i really want to get efficient net on the go um because efficient net is the way um but let's have a look um so you, can you all throw me up some ones if you're at this point Michelle, thank you very much. I'm gonna actually get a sip of tea while I'm here. The cl classic British way in it. Cool, all right. Um, so let's install, um, uh, is there anything actually here? Oh yeah, that's just, I've caught myself out here in the sense that this is just an installation title. And what I usually do, classic Rees, is I usually hide my dependencies in a cell at the top and hide form with um, Colab. I like to do that. So I caught myself out there. So there's nothing there. So don't worry about that. We'll talk about that later. So if we mount our drives, simply the reason we're mounting our drives is because I'm going to get you guys taking your own photos. Um, and I'm going to get you guys creating your own data on the fly, much in that same vein as the kind of user inference loop that I was trying to pull off with Mini B. Um, so again, no stealing my code. How's everyone doing with Colab? Oh, it's worth bearing in mind, actually, um, just a couple of things uh, in terms of um, housekeeping, that we're not going to need to run a GPU in this environment. The whole idea is that um, uh, OpenCV toolkit is available to us. Um, and we actually, no, except for, no, we're actually deploying this time. So bear, uh, forget what I just said. 
Um, you you just need your own. So Jan, um, what you should have done at this point, uh, I'm going to make my face less uh, huge. There you go. Um, what you should have done at this point, Jan. Um, oh, there you go. Okay, no problem. I'm um, just to iterate for anyone else that has that question, and I guess um, is you should have uh, sent your uh, shortcut to your own kind of drive, um, and then you'll be able to mount yourself and then any absolute paths or anything I've got you can kind of you can change that to your own um, so this is a super simple installation what we're doing is we're installing the tensorflow object detection API um, and we're just grabbing all the dependencies we sees we need uh, super simple super nice um, and then you guys should have no problems whatsoever with this. I've debugged this for you. And then you should be able to run this cell. Um, and then you should be able to test your setup. And I believe what it'll do is it'll test with efficient net. So I'm going to give you a few minutes just to do that. Colab is great. Uh, Lena. Yeah, for sure it is. Yeah, for sure, Lena. Um, I'll actually speak about, I, I always speak a little bit about Colab when, when I'm here. Um, it's um, for those of you who are sort of first getting into Colab, um, you basically have ten, uh, Tesla K80s available to you for free. Um, so if you want to get into deep learning, um, you know, you need to do all that, that uh, kind of, sorry, we're supposed to change the name of the drive that we might. And uh, no, not at the moment, Caleb, I, I'll, I'll tell you when that happens. Um, but yeah, like I said, um, the, you get K80s available to you. And for those of you who are using Colab Pro, you also get V100s and P100s available to you. So um, the tensor core kind of post Turing architecture and Volta architecture um, cards that are just absolute data center powerhouses. And we're lucky to have those available to us. And, we, and we're lucky to be able to have that kind of springboard to start learning. Um, deep learning in that sense. Um, sorry, we're supposed to change the name of the dry. Uh, no, oh yeah, sorry. Um, sorry, Caleb, I got uh, distracted by the first part there. So you should have successfully um, installed this part. I'm not sure what's going on here. I think you're all good. Um, and you should have uh, tested your setup at this point. And then you just get a bunch of output for efficient net. Does anyone know what efficient net is? I'm really excited about efficient net. I don't know enough about it yet. I need to do more research on it, but the concept is incredible. Um, and will this, can anyone tell me much about efficient net in terms of um, an object detector? What makes efficient net so intense? What's so good about it? So we've talked about um, SSD mobile net, right? So while this is all installing for you guys, uh, we've talked about that as a single shot detector. And we, we all know like uh, YOLO, um, that you only look once. That was also a single, a single shot kind of idea instead of the slide in window approach. Um, it's not as well documented as the, um, the SSDs, but a fishing net, uh, the, I believe the Google research team worked on it. And what efficient, the, the way efficient net came about was the base model. Um, so the base architecture before it gets scaled up to the rest of the kind of family of different efficient net models, um, width scaling and uh, depth scaling. The base model was created with neural architecture search with auto ML. Does anyone know what neural architecture search is? So we're basically using neural networks to help develop neural networks. Yeah, finds the optimal. Yeah, exactly. Um, so we're kind of enveloping in on, our, on ourselves now, which is incredible. Um, and and it's, 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 yeah, that's exactly what it is. It's kind of like a grid search. That's a really good way of putting it there. Um, is it Chisholm? Um, that's a brilliant way of putting it. It's definitely kind of like a grid search, but instead of 
trying to design by hand. We're letting another machine learning algorithm help us find that efficiency. Um, and like I said, faster RCNN was really bloated when we first started looking at object detection um, algorithms um, they were, or architectures. They were really bloated. The inference time was massive. Um, and usually what it is is the trade-off between mean, mean average precision and inference, right? Um, the, unfortunately, with the earlier ones, faster RCNN and so on, you had to have that trade-off for that inference, the inference um, for mean average precision being so high, the inference was massively long. Efficient net has found a way to solve that. So we've got a balance between really, really efficient inference, and we'll see that in a little bit, and mean average precision. Um, all thanks to the fact that we're, we're getting these guys to work on themselves, which is incredible. It's just mind blowing. Um, uh, so you should be uh, installed at this point. Let's grab some sample images. We're probably not gonna use these, but it's a good idea for when you're looking back at all of this to just see um, the TensorFlow ecosystem in play and the fact that you can just grab all these data sets. We looked at that last session. You can grab all the classic MNISTs and the, the CIFAR 10 and all those guys, and you can even grab test images like this. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to run this cell here. So this cell is obscured, right? So I've obscured it with the title. Um, it's a bunch of JavaScript. I don't know. Is any, does anyone know JavaScript? I'm not, <laughs> I'm not a JavaScript person. So I always hide them and run away. Um, but that's what's happening here. Um, and what a lot of these are is, um, for those of you who are still just getting into Colab, if you check out this section here, um, you got a load of code snippets for cool stuff that you can do with Colab. So that's worth you guys knowing. Um, so that's what's going on here for me. Um, just wanted to own up to the fact that this wasn't me. Um, so if we run this cell, um, and I do um, encourage you guys to experiment. Um, what I'm also doing here is I'm grabbing a timestamp. Now timestamps are really important to me um, in terms of data in general. Um, I think a lot of people just like manually name things, right? And with Mini B and with my bigger robot, Mr. B, or in general with things I'm deploying, um, I always add a timestamp because then I can dynamically give it a name, right? It's, I'm, I, I'm not having to muck around. I can always kind of just go back and search that way. And this means that every time we click a button, we've got our photo and it's, you know, they just stack on top of each other that way. So let's run this cell. Give me one second. Um, sorry, I didn't mute my phone. I'm sure, I'm sure that's happened to a few of you guys already and I haven't just, I just haven't heard it. Um, I'll take photo is not defined. So yeah, so what you wanna do there, um, Jan, is you wanna run this cell first, like I said, you wanna run the cell with um, uh, the, the webcam title. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna make a cam images directory. So, Basically, what's happening here is I want you guys to think about, does anyone know about the COCO data set? Or does anyone know about any of the data sets that any of the, um, uh, the deep learning models or at least the convolutional neural networks have been trained on? That's all right, Jan, no problem. ImageNet, yeah, ImageNet is massive, right? ImageNet has like, Yes, AlexNet, wonderful, Catherine, Coco. Coco is generally what we're going to be dealing with here. A lot, you'll find a lot of the, um, the earlier and the new TensorFlow object detection API um, pre-trained models are um, tiny image net as well, um, are, are based on Coco. Um, I believe it's 80 object classes. I'm, I, know, I'm, I might be wrong. It might actually be something even smaller. It might be 50. I always get it wrong. 80 or 50. It's not that much. Um, whereas ImageNet has a lot. Um, so, you know, th there's a lot of classes. There's a, we, we need really efficient uh, uh, models to do that. So we're gonna work with uh, Coco here. Um, we're gonna see what we can pick up. So 
there's what bicycle orange person cup is definitely on there so i'm trying to get you guys to try and inspire you guys for things that you can put in front of the camera there um so i'm going to take a, a couple to show you an example and i want to get you guys doing the same right now so i'm just going to run this cell last time i took some yeah look at this picture i look like a, a crazy person in this picture um but let's try not to take another one that's so silly um hence the two camera situation. So I'm gonna do orange because I know orange is in there. I know there's something in the background that I'm gonna get rid of actually. Um, so I'm gonna run it again. Um, Cause I wanna really show you how, uh, um, excuse the pun, how efficient efficient net is uh, picking up um, a really kind of granular inference. Um, so these books and these are really good plugs for you guys, actually, in terms of books. Um, there's a, a really good deep learning book on maths, and there's the classic um, uh, O'Reilly book, right, the, um, which has been updated to TensorFlow, too. I, I suggest that you guys uh, go down that road if you're, you're first getting started with deep learning. But what I really want is I want um, the, the granular books there. I want, I want an efficient net to grab every single one of them. We're going to do Coco this time, but then we're going to go back to efficient net to show how much better it is. So let's take those uh, books. Are you guys taking your own photos? How are you doing? Um, oh, let me get a cup with my tea. And we'll go through all these. Um, I feel like I'm cheers into something. Cheers to your conference or to the, um, the summit. Okay, great. I'm going to use this as an opportunity to take a little bit of tea. And that's, um, so yeah, let, let me show you where I'm getting this model from. So we're about to actually grab, um, we're about to grab uh, a model from uh, TensorFlow uh, Object Detection API for TensorFlow 2. There are two versions. Um, and I've put in this simple form for you here so you guys can experiment in your own time. Um, again, these are all single shot. Um, I tend to use them because of this kind of deployment and so on. Um, so that's it's worth bearing that in mind. Efficient net is there for you. Um, and remember, there's a family of efficient nets. This is D7. So it's, um, I'm not sure how this is scaled, actually. Um, I'd be lying if I said I did. Um, yes, but it's for NLP Jan. But yeah, but you can also, if... Um, if you're using TensorFlow Hub or whatever, you can use uh, but for pre-trained embeddings and stuff, but we won't talk about that this time. Um, and yeah, SSD, ResNet, and also SSD Mobile Net. So I want to show you SSD Mobile Net because I want to show you how much it needs to be tweaked and how it's kind of rubbish out of the box. Um, no offense. Um, so let's download that. And let's grab um, our labels, which is the cocoa labels, right? And then we're going to create a category index. So these are all ready to go for you. I debugged this whole situation for you. And it'll take a little bit of time. And again, what we're seeing in action, and what's great here is we get to see um, uh, as a general rule, if a model takes longer, you know, it's, a, it's usually a more complex um, or inefficient in terms of our context um, uh, a model. Um, so we're using the save model uh, um, platform, like I said, because it's depreciated um, the frozen inference graph. So let's actually um, grab and have a look at our category index so we can have a look at the different things that you may be able to take pictures of. Um, has anyone got broccoli? Extra points if you get broccoli in there. Um, I need to eat more broccoli in my life, I think. Too much pizza. Um, I don't know how many parameters efficient net has actually um, uh, chosen room. I believe it's a lot less, <laughs> hence it being efficient. In terms of its, um, um, uh, it's uh, for inferenceability versus um, it, it's it's parameters. It's it's a lot less, but I we'd have to have a look at that. Um, sorry, who's this? Of course not. No broccoli. Yeah, who who wants broccoli? Right. 
But as you all know, as, as those of you who are familiar with um, uh, deep learning in general, we are dealing with thousands of parameters, hence why we can deal with um, uh, high level data, high dimensional data. Um, yeah, so what we're actually going to do with our category index is we're going <laughs> to... Thanks, Michelle. Yes, 56 is broccoli. Do you have a picture? I'll, I'll get so hopefully I get someone to um, I don't know whether we can get you to screen share or we can put it on your camera. Um, if anyone's got broccoli, put it on their camera. Um, but what we're doing is um, uh, we're pickling our category index because I know for sure that we're going to need it later. Um, and I'm sure a lot of you know what pickling is, right? We're just going to we're, we're saving it to file and we're going to save it to our um, Google Drive so it's available to us instead of having to do it again. Just thinking about being efficient. Um, so what's happening here um, is, this is all pre-made for you with the, um, this is all kind of base code um, ready for you go. So we're, we're loading the image with um, pill this time, which is another um, um, image processing library. If you're more comfortable with that, you'll find a lot of examples out of there using this library. Um, and then we're just lo loading it as, a, as an array. Um, for the, those of you who know about computer vision, you know, it's um, taking out the RGB channels. It's just um, a, a, a 2D, right? With um, uh, pixel intensities between zero and 255, right? Um, so we're basically looking at discrete pixel intensities. So we wanna do all kinds of cool stuff like finding the right combinations of weights that are gonna get us edges and we're gonna wanna pull in parts of our um, architecture so we can find all the abstract translation and variant things like the corner of books um, in the middle of a, um, I'm glad my friend didn't say something really uh, inappropriate though on Discord. Um, uh, so we might find um, like the corners of books right in the middle of just a, a stack of things translation and variance comes out of that, that kind of idea, right? Um, uh, so what we're doing with um, plot detections is we're literally just loading to a tensor um, and then the rest is done for you. These are all visual uh, visualization, sorry, I'm falling over my own words, visualization um, tools on the back of it. I believe it's just um, open computer vision, um, uh, open CV um, doing all this for you. Um, just uh, drawing the bounding boxes um, and then we're just going to plot our figure so let's do this i hope that you guys have gotten as far as got, getting your images and i've um i'm going to use the globe library um which i'm sure a lot of you have used to recursively um check what pictures i have i thought i took more than two um yes i took three um and then i'm just going to copy them over to my Google Drive ready for the next notebook. Um, and then all I'm doing here, and we saw a little bit of this yesterday and I kind of tripped myself up on it. Um, I've been doing this a lot lately. I, this has become my thing is having an observable widget. So if I run this um, with iPy widgets, every time I move this or choose a drop down, um, and feel free to use this, this is really cool. Um, it, not only do I clear my display output, um, sorry, no such file or directory. Um, sorry about this, guys. VJ um, uh, ground to run or deployment. Yeah, so what, this is that point actually I was talking about earlier. And sorry to jump around here, guys. Um, I don't want to get you lost, but um, going back to the start of this, when we mounted our drive, we sent the you you send the file to a shortcut to your Google Drive, right? So you're actually going to want to change this. So you'll ordinarily have this part, and then you're going to want to change this path to where you've put your folder. So that's up to you in terms of kind of the, the debugging and the kind of um, the detective work there. No problem, VJ. Um, So yeah, like I said, um, what we're doing here that's really cool is every time we choose this dropdown, we're going to perform inference and we're going to plot it and we're going to plot the dropdown boxes. And what's really cool for you guys here in terms of reusing this notebook is 
you can check out all the different versions, all the different architectures. You can check them out on the fly, whether it's a data set that you need to use or want to use. Because for you, it's not as simple as just taking a model and just putting it into deployment. There are certain data sets that are going to carry for you in terms of transfer learning or, or pulling it into different contexts for your scenario or for your workplace or for your team. This is a good way of verifying that. Um, your clear output's just going to clear your display every time we choose a new picture. Um, so let's choose one. Let's see what happens with mobile net SSD. I, I don't think it's going to do so well, um, but we will see. Yeah. So <laughs> it thinks there's a teddy bear in there. It's a, you, what you can what you can see here is you don't see the um, label because it's a little bit off the frame, but it's grabbed person here, and you can see that it has multiple detections here, right? Um, so let's try another image. Person again, but it didn't pick up the cup, right? And then we got person. How is everyone else doing? Did everyone anyone else get anything good there? Anyone get broccoli? All right, let's try a fishing net because a fishing net is going to really uh, help us out in this situation, I believe. So let's go back um, and then let's switch to a fishing net and let's download. I thought your headset was a cell phone. Yeah, it's uh oh. Um, It's funny, isn't it? Everyone's, everyone's always talking about artificial intelligence taking over the world, and then you see a, you see a headset, is a, a cell phone, and you're like, oh, you go, we got a long way to go. Um, and then let's load our model again. Do you see how easy it is to loop back in on ourselves? Um, and let's check what happens with the next one. And then we'll move on to the next. Um, uh, or maybe actually what I'll do is we'll go through another pass and we'll look at how long it takes for faster RCNN to load um, and how it's not really efficient in terms of the deployment. And then we'll go through the Open Vino notebook because I'm really excited to show you that toolkit because there's a huge playground for you guys to get involved in. Um, it shouldn't take that much longer now. Um, I believe it's like a minute or so. It's scarier if they're not accurate. Yeah, for sure. Um, so... But we, we, we're all going to put in the work, right? There's a lot of really smart people out there right now. And um, uh, I enjoy following uh, those developments. And like I said, to go back on myself when this is loading, it's uh, crazy that's taking so long. Um, uh, it's um, NVIDIA powerhouse right now in terms of an entire um, ecosystem. So if you guys want to fall down this hole um, in terms of all kinds of neural network models. I, I uh, urge you to not only check out their edge stack, but also to check out their um, entire ecosystem in general. It's, um, it's incredible what you can do with, um, I mean, a lot is based on top of CUDA now, right now. Um, I mean, I think AMD uh, ching up now, um, is it, uh, but um, it's all about the CUDA and it's all about the NVIDIA, isn't it? Um, so that, I've already loaded this, but let's do it again. Um, I hope you guys are following. Um, we should have our images anyway. And let's see what happens. Again, it'll take a little while. Cell phone, oh man, it went so well last time. There we go, we got orange in person. Last time I did this, it had like all the things. There you go, we got all the books and we got them uh, granular as well. Last time I did this, we had a person and we had a person here. It's a little bit obscured in the image. It picked up a person, a person and um, all of these individual books even though they're just the corners showing. So you, you see the difference with the fishing net and with um, SSD there, right? Um, the difference in architecture um, and so on. Um, so let's switch to faster RCNN while we switch to the other notebook if you're 
happy to do the um, uh, multitasking. Oh, in fact, I don't have faster RCNN. Let's have a look at faster RCNN in the next um, session. So what we're going to do is um, if you save this, so you've saved all your changes, so you can have a look back at this um, later on and show your friends and show your colleagues. Um, so let's get rid of that. Um, let's go back to edge deployment. And then let's go to open Vino full Redux. I always call things when I've reworked them, I always call them Redux because they feel like a cool movie. Um, oh, bear with me one second. I don't know why I did them. I got a silly toolbar up here now. Can't. That's the first time I've noticed that I muted myself. Usually I don't notice. Um, okay, so we should be here now. Um, so we're, we're gonna push ourselves towards the finale now where um, it's gonna take a little time, but we've gone from understanding what the edge is, why the edge is so important to us right now, where we could possibly head in the future where we've got these tiny devices in the palm of our hands. Um, one of the NVIDIA development boards right now, um, I'm thinking of getting, has like eight gigabyte RAM and it has a six core CPU and it has like 40 tensor cores in the palm of your hand. So you can imagine the things that you can do with that without having to outsource, right? Um, so we've, we've gone there and we're wanting to deploy, right? We, um, so we're wanting to optimize our model. And like I said, we could do that with TensorFlow Lite if we wanted, we could do it with the NVIDIA stack. Here, we're gonna use the OpenVINO toolkit because it gives us that agnosticism in the sense that we can do stuff on this platform, we can do it on all your different operating systems and we can boost it with one of these, which I recommend you get the sequel to the Neural Compute Stick 2 because they're affordable, they're about 60 pounds, wherever that is in bucks on your side of the world. Um, but um, whereas a lot of other development boards, if you wanted to get involved, they're a little bit pricey. Um, so if you're wanting to just get in, get on the open Vino bandwagon in that sense. Um, so this time we have uh, dependencies to install, right? So let's double click on that. And you'll see what I've got here is we've got a context timer. We've got um, FFmpeg. Um, we're gonna have to do a little bit of pre-processing when we're looking at spectrograms of our voice, um, simply because this version of this uh, recurrent neural network takes 16-bit mono audio. Um, so there's, it's very specific simply because it deploys on things like this. Whereas the, the Mozilla Deep Speech project in general, when you start using it or when you start falling down this hole, it's supposed to be robust and you're supposed to be able to take all different kinds of wave files and all different kinds of spectrograms in there. Um, but we'll have a look at that later. But that's why I'm installing this, just so you guys know. Um, so let me hide this code um, again, just for efficiency. Um, and then again, let's, um, sorry, I can't think of the word. Let's mount the drive. Clearly I need a sip of tea. Um, so let me just take a second to do that. Has anyone in, in out there uh, had any experience with Yes, sorry, I muted myself. Thank you, Aria. This is a, it's becoming my, a trend. Every time I move this little toolbar here, I mute myself. I do apologize. Um, okay, so we should be mounted at this point. Bear me one second. My toolbar is being silly again. Okay, great, we're back. Um, and like I said, at this point, we're not going to run this cell. Um, I, in fact, I should have take, took it, sorry, taken it out. Um, uh, but I was debugging kind of situations. OpenVINO is going to do it all for us. It's going to install our, all our dependencies. It's going to install 
specific versions of um, open computer vision and it will install uh, specific versions of TensorFlow and so on and so forth. Um, it's a whole package. When you end up doing this in your own environment, maybe on your desktop or maybe on your own Raspberry Pi or on your own um, kind of deployable machine, um, you'll want to not only create your own virtual environment, but you're going to want to add, uh, you're going to want to export your open uh, CV environment variables with your bash RC or whatever and it is you use um, to a source of terminal, right? Um, but this is all done here. Um, so we've got like a, a self-contained environment here, but we can, so what I'm gonna do is install and don't worry about the rest of this right now. We're just gonna install uh, the 2019 revision of OpenVINO. So if we just uh, don't click any of these boxes, this is only here to just delete the old files and um, to download if you guys were getting rid of them if it was too much space for you guys. But it takes a little while to download, so I've got them ready for you, so you should be able to just copy them into your environment. I'm not sure we're actually supposed to be doing this um, in the sense that you usually register your product, but um, I haven't been told off yet. I hope no one in the audience works for Intel. Um, so you should have this here, and then we're just going to unzip. And then it will uh, build and install everything for us. And what we'll be doing is we'll be migrating a part of our workspace to uh, Google Drive, simply because um, uh, every time we download from the model zoo and so on, or um, have our own models and we optimize those ready for deployment, they'll always be ready. Um, uh, I'm not sure actually whether it'll be ready um, recorded for later. I'd imagine so. Um, we'll, I, we'll answer for that, that for you later, but um, apologies for not knowing the answer. Oh, there you go. Yes, it will be. Um, so like I was saying, I've actually lost my way there, but um, I'll just carry on. Um, oh yes, yeah, so in terms of deployment, um, so the way I've built this notebook for you guys is uh, we'll be pushing some of it to um, Google Drive um, in the sense that you don't have to go through this process again if you want to deploy on a neural computer stick or if you want to deploy on another machine, you know it's always available for you. Or what I often do is I will um, send to a cloud bucket, um, whether you've got S3 or whether you've got a G Cloud bucket, whatever platform you use. That's always a handy way of just having that like immediate um, draw of models available to you in every context there. Um, so again, the hybrid edge, right? We're using the cloud, but we're deploying on the edge there. So we can start mucking around with all these different paradigms. Um, so this should have um, installed for you at this point. Um, and you should see that it's available as uh, OpenVINO toolkit there, right? Um, <coughs> We're going to just uh, set this to false, the Boolean here, because um, this is only for the 2021 revision. Um, the 2021 revision is named in a strange way, so we have to, we have to just move it to Intel OpenVINO. Um, so let's, like I said, uh, just to reiterate, we're just going to switch that to false um, and then install our dependencies. And like I said, if you were doing this in a local environment, um, you'd be installing in your own virtual environment. And you would also be um, uh, exporting those environment variables, but we'll just be working in a contained environment here. It's just worth you guys knowing. There are really good tutorials on OpenVINO's um, uh, site for this stuff. So can I get some ones if you guys are at this point? I know this is all kind of procedural at this point, but um, yes, thank you, Michelle, wonderful. For sure. I'll grab you the link to the material right now. There you go. 
Okay, so we, at this point, we should be successfully run. And again, it'll tell you that you're not, no problem at all. Um, you'll see that you it'll give you the little warning that you should be in a separate sandbox, right? It's like we were talking about, but it doesn't matter so much here because we're just in a, in a, a collab instance. Um, but it's worth bearing that in mind. So we've got everything we need, uh, TensorFlow and so on and so forth. And now we're going to go into our demos. Um, and we're going to see that in our model zoo, there's a lot going on. Um, and you're going to want to check out the Python demo situation. Or for those of you who are like C aficionados, there's a bunch that's going on there. And you can see that with this old version, like I said, um, or this at least this previous revision, it's all vision based, right? So this is good for us. Um, let's run the demo just to check that our environment's working. And what we should see um, is that it's grabbing an inference, sorry, a intermediate representation, which is a optimized model that compressed um, version of an inference graph. And then it will just be running a test similar to TensorFlow 2. And then we're gonna grab a model from TensorFlow 1 object detection uh, zoo. So I'll give you a second for that to load. You see it's convert into an intermediate representation there. And then we should get a bunch of success there. Um, and then it should be building the inference engine samples at this point. So I'll talk a little bit while it's doing that and then we'll get a bunch of ones if you're at this point. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to create a workspace um, for um, we're going to start off with SSD because it's going to be efficient for us in terms of verifying um, something very similar to what we did with Mini B with the Raspberry Pi there. Um, so we're going to create our workspace here um, and then we're going to download a model from TensorFlow Object Detection Model Zoo for TensorFlow 1. Now the reason I'm getting you guys to do with TensorFlow 1 here is my experience so far, and it's starting to change, starting to push on, is there's that little gap between TensorFlow 1 and TensorFlow 2 in terms of stability and compatibility with a lot of APIs out there, right? So um, in terms of doing the nitty gritty, like transfer learning with TensorFlow Object Detection API, you have to take your own data set, right? You need to get enough data and you've got to label all those specific classes, right? And create your own TF records and then your own augmentations and your own config files and all these different things. For me, I'm familiar with that procedure and there's a lot of documentation about that procedure. Um, we're still getting there with TensorFlow 2 and there's still, um, I believe some models um, are still incompatible. There's a lot that is compatible and it's really efficient and you can take it from the zoo right now. But I just wanted to show you this approach just so you're ready for that, you know, having to kind of go backwards in compatibility a little bit. Um, it's always handy to know, isn't it? Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to, uh, uh, this is this still building? Bear me one second, guys. So um, actually, before I jump ahead, is, is everyone built and executed? So what you should have is you should have a demo of it, uh, of image classification for cars. We can't see the image. I believe it's a blue car. Can I get ones if we're successful for the image classification? Great. Michelle, you're always ahead of the game. Always sprinting to the finish. Okay, great. Um, I'm gonna assume uh, a, a lot of other people are there. Um, great. So, um, like I said, so let's CD back to just the, it's not quite the root of the notebook, but everything ends up at content, right? Um, so let's just leave it a cocoa, like I said. And I put a little thing in there if you want your own like custom models. Um, and then we're just going to make our workspace directory. And then we're going to do it again just to make sure we've done it right. And you can see what I'm doing is I'm unzipping it to my drive so it's available for me for future use. Okay. 
Now, what you should see is what we were talking about before. We should see a frozen inference graph. So everything in one place. And again, bear in mind with save models, we've got separate assets. And what I want to show you here, because you're probably going to be knocking around these a bunch um, when you're optimizing all your different models, when you're deploying all these different things, um, and especially if you're getting engaging in transfer learning, is all these different um, uh, configuration files. Now, these are all very architecture specific. I've actually gone ahead and put these um, in for you for this specific configuration. So with SSD, we've got the specific SSD v2 support JSON. Um, we've also got our pipeline configuration here, which is really going to be, it's going to become really important for you when you're engaging in transfer learning, because that's where you change all your augmentations and your batch size um, and so on and so forth. So bear in mind that that's a thing with pre-trained models. You don't have to worry too much. It's all kind of ready to go. Um, but if everything is successful so far, you should be able to just run this cell. Um, and we're reversing our input channels as well. So RGB, I always forget which way around it is, but OpenVINO um, needs a specific channel configuration. I don't know whether it's BGR or RGB, but they need it reversed most of the time. So um, let's run that cell. And you should get the same process as we had last time where we're compressing and we're creating um, a intermediate representation that's deployable in all our different platforms agnostically. Um, so let's see if that works out for us. more tea. And while this is actually happening, um, I just want to show you guys that you can actually scale this idea up to something really big like this guy. He's actually um, a big bundle of wires right now, but um, but yeah, this is using um, a also using two neural compute sticks too. So it's worth you bearing in mind that um, you can something I haven't talked about yet is you can use um, uh, as many. I don't know how many, um, but you can use a lot of um, neural compute sticks in parallel. You can use them together for one deployment, and they'll um, they'll speed up inference. You can also use them separately for models. Um, so I could have a object detection model um, running its own inference, and then I could have a NLP or um, a, um, a spectrogram model also running in parallel to that with two separate neural compute sticks. So that's the kind of um, benefit of the kind of modular nature here. Um, so it's worth bearing that in mind. So at this point, you should have success again. You should have your intermediate representation it didn't take us that long. So um, we're going to skip TensorFlow 2, but I'll leave it there for you in case you want to use it. Um, and then I've left you a little bit of a section here. Maybe we can look at it later, um, showing how the model zoo works with TensorFlow 2. It's literally just using the downloader tool, right? And then it's using the converter tool. And then we can just grab uh, EfficientNet B5, which is part of the EfficientNet family, a different version to um, B7 we were looking at earlier. Um, it might be D7. I, I get the naming convention wrong sometimes. Um, but yeah, we download. And then right after that, we get to optimize. And then it's ready for deployment. Uh, simple as that. The only difference is when you're using this cell is we won't, you won't be using the version of the inference engine, like I said before, um, that we're going to use now. Because the plugin scenario is a lot different. In, in that the plugin automatically recognizes what CPU extension you need or whether you've got a myriad. Um, what's going on here? Op operation not permitted. Um, is that something to do with um, uh, your file path again there? It feels like um, 
Yeah. Um, it should, it should work if you've changed it. Um, what, what I'll do, Michelle, is um, I'll allow you to debug that. But luckily, what's um, I know it's working on my scenario, so I can at least show you. Um, and then you can check out those um, uh, file paths there. And I'm, I'm sorry that that's the case for you, Michelle. And we can always loop back if we need. Um, uh, no problem at all. Um, so yeah, bear that in mind in terms of uh, TensorFlow deployment. And do have a look at this model zoo. Because I, like I said, there's a lot of different stuff that's not just object object detection now. So let's check our work, right? We're not going to source here. This was just me showing them um, last session I did. But what we're going to do is we're going to write this base code test app. Um, and this doesn't do anything. This just checks. This just loads our CPU extension. We're going to need that because we're on Colab and we're not using the, the Myriad X uh, uh, VPU. And then it just checks if there's anything available to us and whether there's um, a uh, deployable inference graph. So you can use this to check your work. And then we're just going to load our environment variables and we're going to run our test app and you should get an IR successfully loaded inference engine. Now for all of you who end up going down this road where you are deploying your own models, you know that you get at this point and you run this and it successfully runs, you're, you're a happy person. A lot of people will go down the road of doing all these things and it's it's not compatible and you get the unsuccessful and it's 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 a heartbreaker. Um, but we're all really impatient. We're sorry, we're all patient computer programmers, aren't we? So this is what we do. We're really good at it. Um, so I'm just going to check that files are available to me in Google Drive. Um, so I've got a stock picture of a person that I, I know works really well in this scenario. And we're also going to... Um, do it frame by frame with a video. Um, so let's have a look at that in a second. I've actually done all of this for you because I figured it would take us forever if we were going through a two hour session, right? Um, but this is me trying to emulate as close as I can to what was happening there in the real world. And if I just take a sip of tea a second, it's just the same thing. We are loading our inference um, engine library. I've got my multi-processing in there um, and I've got argpass so we can have command line arguments, which is always handy to do to, to verify different models and different inputs on the fly, right? Um, step 29, the enter for the models. Uh, bear me one second, let me just go back. So you shouldn't have had to. You shouldn't have had to enter any mod, uh, names. It should all be just super smooth. Step twenty nine. Oh, you you don't. Um, so like I said before, I'm sorry to jump around there, guys. So like I said before, these are I've probably made it quite confusing. But these are the choices of model. You can actually just add more models if you wanted to this. Um, so I just created a little drop down for you guys. This is if you wanted a um, a custom in uh, workspace. So that's for. Um, but I made it confusing. So yeah, like like I said, and um, we're we're loading our own um, uh, extension and so on and so forth. Um, we're loading our inference, we're grabbing our blob, um, and then we're taking that inference and we're multiplying it by the frame so we can get the exact coordinates of the bounding box. Um, and then all we're doing is using the asynchronous a, um, API to queue up inference and then have another one on the go whilst we're, um, we're plotting with OpenCV. Um, so actually, we didn't look at this last time. This is actually pretty stock as well. We're actually just, just whacking the metrics onto top of our bounding box. Um, when you guys go down the OpenCV uh, rabbit hole, you'll see you can add all kinds of things, all different colors and so on and so forth. And we're going to whack in our rendering time. Um, and what I've left here now is I wanted you guys to be able to switch with ArgPass. I wanted with the um, command line inference, I wanted you to be able to switch between creating a video and creating an image. Now, something was going along uh, wrong along the way with the different handles I had, so I've put it all into the video one, and we'll have a look at that in a second. 
So what we'll actually do is we'll just uncomment this so we can get a video frame by frame. Um, I'll let you guys do some videos in a bit. Um, and then hopefully we'll get that frame by frame inference. And then what OpenCV will then do is it will write those bounding boxes and then it will write that frame to a video and then it will output that either to your drive or it will output that locally if you wanted it to. So this is a good way of verifying your own pre-recorded videos if you wanted to do that as well. Um, and it's also a good way of kind of emulating this situation before you actually get into the engineering of that. So let's try, um, and I actually had this multi-processing situation in here, but it doesn't really do much in this kind of environment, but I just wanted you to see the idea of grabbing from the queue and then doing something else if the queue is empty, right? Um, just so you've got an idea of that. So let's just overwrite or write test.py. And again, we're using, uh, where is it? A video capture, which, like I said, was is really robust, right? You can have all these different input streams coming in, and it handles that really well. Um, and then we just got a while loop that's just suggesting while our stream is open, we do all of these things that we were suggesting earlier. So if it's one image, it will just stop. Or it'll loop through all the images, or it'll loop through all the frames of a video, or it'll keep going if there's a camera feed. It's it's super flexible that way. So let's run that. Um, I'm going to copy video MP4 over because I've got it ready. I've already made a video for myself, but you can feel free to do your own video. And maybe I'll actually do my own video um, so you can see how flexible it is in that sense. Um, and now what we should be able to do is I already have a path for a person here. I have my CPU extension. Um, if you were doing this and if you guys next week are like, oh man, I'm, I gotta do this right now. I wanna get it and I'll whack it in simply as simple as putting it like just in there. All you need to do is just change this. Um, you need to just get rid of this CPU extension handle. And then you just need to change your device. I've actually mucked around a little bit with the code here. But I believe ordinarily there's a device handle with the stock code um, that allows you to see I've got the device's CPU there. You just change that to Myriad and then you're deploying on your neural compute stick. Um, that simple. Um, and then what else is there to explain? And then obviously our frozen in inference graph, which we have now ready to deploy whenever we want off our drive or our bucket. Let's give it a shot and then we'll just um, see what happens. So it should do it really quick because it's mobile net SSD, right? It's a really, um, really efficient one. Um, and this was me trying to do a really high res image earlier, so I'm not going to do that. There you go. And now what we've done is what we just saw um, with the, the robot earlier is we're doing the exact same thing, but we're just doing it with a single frame, right? So. We're getting our bounding box, so we're getting our coordinates of the, so we're multiplying the inference again by the frame to get our our X, our y min, our y max, our x min, our x max, and we're getting we can get our midpoints if we were in another scenario here, right? And then we can follow those midpoints if we were wanting to detect and we were wanting to track, and then we've got our cocoa labels that we pickled from before, right? And then even inference time so we can check how good our models are doing these things and async is not going to matter for us because we've only put one image through um so is everyone i'm, I'm going to get the ones up again and then we're going to try with video and then we're going to try spectrograms and then we'll get nicely to the end of the two hours i think um so throw me up some ones if um you're at this point or are you doing this with your own image? Maybe you can do this with your own image. Maybe I should try, actually. Um, let's have a look. What images have I got over here? So again, don't forget to throw me up those ones if you're at this point. We got a one. I like that. Oh, no, that's from me. I do apologize. That's okay. So if you guys aren't at this point, um, this should all work out 
for the little bit of debugging. This is all, all ready to go um, in your own time. So let's try another one. Let's overwrite. And then we should be able to grab um, There you go, cuff. Hey, SSD got a cuff. Well done, SSD. Getting it done. Um, brilliant. Didn't get me though, but that's okay. Um, it's actually worth bearing in mind is that um, for those of you who are going to start using Open Computer Vision within Colab specifically, um, you can't use uh, CV2 IM show within uh, Colab. I don't know what the reason is for that, but you got to use this patches version or you can do um you can use plot i am sure from a uh, uh, matplotlib that's no problem as well um so let's move on to videos so like i said all we're doing is we're grabbing our inference we're doing it frame by frame we're grabbing those localizations and we're tracking them right and then we and then we're writing frame by frame we only did it with one image let's do it let's create a video algorithmically and so for those of you who um, saw the last session, I did something similar with a neural network where I interrupted the neural network with the Lambda callback, right? So you can think about it the same way where you interrupt the neural network and you look at the activations with OpenCV and then you write that frame to a video. And that's exactly what we're doing here, which is writing frame by frame. Um, so let me uh, uncomment this. So for those of you who have working code right now, Let's just uncomment this guy. Like I said, I need to debug this a little in the sense that um, I think I've just got a bunch of nested stuff here, right? And it gets complicated. Um, uh, and then let's change this because I've just switched this over um, to video MP4. I just copied it over, didn't I? So there we go. And let's overwrite this. Now, if we're lucky, we should get a video output. Should take a little bit of time. Yeah, so we know it's working. It's always a sign of relief when it's taking a little bit of time. Great. Um, and I've, I've written it to, um, if we go up to the top there, uh, I believe I've written it to output.mp4. So I did have, um, I was using Cora to try and, um, let's see if Cora works this time. Cora is great for um, uploading large videos and viewing them locally in, a, um, in Colab. I don't know whether it will work this time because it wasn't working the other day, um, but let's have a look. If not, we'll just view it on my, um, in my drive. Nah, it's not doing it again. That's okay. Um, so what we should be able to do uh, is I should have it sent over. Or is this the old one? Yeah, I know. Is it? Uh, and what we should get is if I just oh I gotta just double click on it. I've got on how. Yeah. So what you should just get is this. So we're doing the exact same thing. You can see it's a little bit low res there, right? Because um, I got a, I, I did a pre-recorded low low res thing and looking like a bit of a dork there. But you can see all those f uh, false detections flicking up as well. Um, remember we were talking about um, those uh, those anchor boxes, um, all, all kind of predefined and stuff. Um, they're just like flicking up there. I don't know what it thinks it's seeing when. It, oh no, it's you can see it thinks it's seen a donut. I don't know whether it, that's, I should be offended by the fact that it thinks my fingers are donuts. But um, but yeah, so you, again, we've got exactly the same situation with the CV, uh, uh, the rendering time and the person um, class and so on and so forth. I believe this is low res um, because I need to get into the, the, the um, open computer vision um, uh, write-in functionality um, and change the resolution there. But 
again, I wouldn't quote me on that. There's so much to always remember. Um, so I'll let you guys de debug it at that point. So what I'm going to do is we're going to restart our notebooks and we're going to use the new revision and we're going to go down the recording our voice road with bi-directional recurrent neural networks, which is to say um, we're basically taking a spectrogram and we're pushing it through one direction through a, a recurrent neural network and then, then through backwards. And what that happened, what, what that does is it gives us context. You know, like if we're, if I'm saying a word and I, I'm predicting the next word is going to be like, uh, you know, orange or something, and then I don't know the rest of the sentence, it's hard for me to predict the context. But if I'm coming at the problem backwards at the same time, then it's easier for me to predict that next word, word right? Because we're given that kind of, that bi-directional spatial context. Um, so just to give you a kind of quick overview on bi-directional um, uh, RNNs. So let's restart our notebook. Um, so let's go here and let's factory reset our runtime. And I'm gonna show you how quick it is to deploy with the open Vino model zoo. Um, so we're not gonna use any external APIs this time. We're gonna use this entire tool chain and it's super quick. Um, so let's install our dependencies again. I'm probably gonna have to mount again. I'm gonna get rid of these so my computer doesn't lock up. It's uh, it classically does that. Um, and I'm gonna use this to take some tea. So again, we're gonna have a, a, a JavaScript cell that allows us to record voice in Colab. Like Colab is pretty amazingly uh, um, flexible at these things. You can go down all kinds of crazy rabbit holes. Um, so let me uh, authorize this again. Give me one second. So while it's authorizing, what we're going to want to do now is we're going to want to switch to the 2021 revision. And we're just going to go through the same process, but a tiny bit different. So make sure that you switch that Dropbox there. Um, and then we'll just copy over again. It's available for you in your drive if you haven't deleted it, if you have the space. Um, so let's do that. And let's make sure that that's the case. Yeah, so we have the 2021. And you'll notice here that I haven't actually, um, I was uh, a little lazy and I didn't write in the um, uh, some kind of efficient interactive code to have you switch this. So make sure you copy the, uh, the revision into our unzip in here. Um, so let's do that. But what I have done ahead of the game for you guys is if we switch this Boolean, and again, this could have been interactive. Um, we actually just need to move OpenVINO over to a generic um, file naming convention. And then we'll go through the process of installing again. Um, and we I'm pretty confident in the sense that um, I don't think we need to run the demo this time. I think I'm pretty sure I've done this so many times now that it's going to run. Um, just to save ourselves a little bit of time because I want to get us um, translating our voice. And while this is doing this, I'll talk a little bit more about a Mozilla uh, deep speech. Um, it's based on a, a paper. Um, it's, for those of you who might know, I think it's Baidu, um, um, did a, um, a paper uh, on a very specific kind of uh, bi-directional recurrent new, neural network. Um, the paper's called Deep Speech. It's worth checking out. Um, there's um, all kinds of like um, 
beam search decoding happening as well. So look at that up when you can. But um, the deep speech, the Mozilla deep speech project is open source and it's incredible the amount of work that they've put into it and the credible, the amount of work they're putting into helping people deploy it. Um, What's great about it is just like the TensorFlow Object Detection API and all these other um, APIs is you can um, perform transfer learn with it. You can fine tune it for your um, uh, your idiolect or your accent um, and just make it more efficient in that sense. I won't go into it this time. We've had a lot to cover, um, but do check out Mozilla Deep Speech um, away from this deployment as well. This is a very efficient kind of optimized deployment. Um, but just encouragement to check out that project if you're wanting to fall down that NLP um, uh, role for uh, your work space or your workplace or your team or wh who, whatever the context of your situation is. Um, so this should be done um, shortly. So let's go all the way down here, right down to the bottom, and it should be available to us if I've done this right. All right, um, so what we're going to do is hopefully we're going to change our file directory to C to C the code and we just need to run, we just need to install a few more dependencies to get this working. And then we're going to look at um, uh, Python demos, we're going to look at the speech recognition demo is pre made and ready to go, like I said, the whole zoo and the demos situation is like this entire playground for you to mess around with. Do feel free to have a look at this. Um, and again, to reiterate, it's not just vision models now, it's across the board. Um, voice recorder um, is just JavaScript. Again, I'm going to run away from that for all kinds of reasons. Um, let's just run that cell. Um, And then let's run this cell. This is just a blank cell, so I'll get rid of this for you. So if we run this cell now, it should allow us to record. Um, or it isn't re recording, so I'll overwrite it, actually. Um, and we should be able to play it. Um, but I don't want something that big yet, because I haven't like performed my own uh, training yet. I want something kind of easy for it to transcribe, but it works pretty well out of the box. So um, let's just listen back to that. It's probably rubbish. So I'll overwrite it actually. Yeah, and I'm talking in my my Welsh drawl, so I'll try and speak in an enunciated way. Um, so well, I'm actually gonna use this as an opportunity to start saying goodbye to you guys. Um, so what I'll say is, thank you so much for coming. And let's hope it let's hope it translates it. We'll see. And feel free to do this. I, I you know I built this whole thing so you guys can be interacting while we're doing this. Um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna save it to Wave with SciPy. And like I said before, this specific version of Deep Speech needs 16-bit mono. So I've debugged that situation for you. You'll always be able to run it through this notebook if you need to. Um, check that out or you need to script it your own way if you're you know deploying it on in whatever kind of pipeline you're looking at and um again our environment variables um, and then we're going to run the speed recognition demo um which is going to um load the deep speech model and our wave file and hopefully I didn't run this step. Okay, so um, let's go back a little bit. I got ahead of myself. So remember I was saying before that we've got to download with the tool and we've got to convert with the tool. Let's do that first. Um, so thank you, Colab, for letting me know. Um, so make sure that you run this step first. But everything else should be ready for me to go now, I believe. So this is a, it, I mean, it's handy that we actually got to loop back because I get to then reiterate 
that this is what you'll do if you're mucking around with open models or you don't want to use your own models. These are all available for you pre-trained. You just run this kind of and just change the model name um, for the conversion and for the downloading. So it'll take a little while. Um, and this is actually an opportunity to take questions from you guys while we're downloading here. Does anyone have any questions at this point? That's okay. We should get um, a good bit of translation now. Once it sorts itself out. Um, and I guess what I'll do is I'll take this opportunity to recap. So like I said, um, it's easy for you guys. If you're like, ah, oh, deep learning, I got to figure out all the theory and I got to figure out how to build these architectures from scratch. It's really easy to deploy deep learning models right now. You know, it isn't all just about deep learning in the world. You know, there's all kinds of other experimentations like hierarchical temporal memory and all the cool stuff that the mentor's doing, right? All the biologically inspired stuff. But we're talking about deep learning because it's just, it's taken over the industry, right? It's, it's getting easier and easier to do with uh, graphics cards. But as you're seeing here, you actually don't really need a graphics card as well if you're just wanting to deploy in this kind of scenario. You can just optimize and you can whack it on OpenVINO or you can whack it on TensorFlow Lite or whatever platform we haven't had the chance to look at in two hours. So do get involved. I do encourage you. Um, so you should have this at this point. You should have a success. Everything else should be okay for us now and available. So let's give it a shot. No such directory. So I think I need to do this part. And we're doing it. It did it. Perfect. 100%. I can't believe it. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for coming. I'm, thank you, Deep Speech, for helping me do that. Um, so I'm just going to answer this question to Zurim. Um, what's the learning process for understanding perhaps our self-driving car sees? Yeah, so yeah, no, you're right. There's, there's, so there's different... Um, different approaches like we were talking about earlier image segmentation is one of them where yeah you you're doing like kind of pixel semantics so you're um you're labeling like um pixel based um or you're labeling um uh you know the whole road and you want to segment in that sense the the polygon um uh, you'll see uh, a, a lot of kind of semantic labels as well with things like uh generative artificial neural networks where we're mapping one idea to another idea, right? Um, but there's also object detection like we're seeing here. So when you're driving, you're going to see that there are other cars or there are, um, you know, uh, pedestrians or other objects of interest. Um, so, you you know, you've got those working in conjunction. Um, I'm not working on a self-driving team, so I'm not sure all of the stuff that they're doing. Um, but on top of that, there are also other ideas and you'll, there are lots of open source ideas now. Um, like there's um, behavior clone, behavioral cloning, sorry, I'm falling over my own words again, um, where someone can basically perform the, um, the action themselves, much like kind of, it's like reinforcement learning light, right? So we do the action ourselves um, and then we, the model tries to then mimic that action behavioral cloning. That's happening a lot in the hobbyist uh, world right now. It's happening with Donkey Car. If you guys see that platform, that's a good way um, to get into behavioral cloning. Um, and then also reinforcement learning, um, where we have you know uh, the, an agent uh, learning in often in a simulated environment or in a um, uh, in in a dream state. Um, a good example of that is uh, um, for something for you guys to get involved in if you want to get your foot in the door um, is uh, is Deep Racer, um, AWS's Deep Racer League. Um, you can get really quickly started with uh, reinforcement learning in terms of 
and that uses a convolutional neural network to figure out the road, but then that feeds into training um, in a simulated gazebo um, environment, in a robot operating system environment. Um, so there, there are lots of different approaches, and it's good to see that Michelle's got it working as well. Um, so it's quite a rabbit hole for you guys to go down. No worries, though, because there's a lot of stuff out there um, to help you guys get started. Um, and I hope this was a you know tiny bit of an introduction into how easy it is for you guys to fall down this rabbit hole. Um, and I'll thank you all for coming and I'll stick around for a few more questions and uh, good luck on your journey and good luck for the rest of this summit.